Welcome everyone to the Midnight Ride question and answer segment. Uh, tonight we've gone through the fellowship group and there are three questions that stand out above all the rest and we're also going to be answering other questions and questions that you guys have tonight. And of course joining me is the David Carrico. What's up David? It is all good. Glad to be here and uh, glad to be here with our Midnight Ride listeners. Gonna yeah. be gonna be great. Gonna be a good one. Gonna be a good one. Yeah, and I've got a few pretty good questions here tonight. So I'm gonna actually pull those up. I didn't. I should usually print them out and have them here, but I put it on the thumbnail, and I so I can remember from those. Man, okay. So this first question tonight, guys. I'm just gonna get right into it because um, there's a, a, quite a few questions, and I feel like we could spend a considerable amount of time on any of them. Uh, just you know, just depending on what, how much they um, need to be time spent on them. So there's the theory going around, and I'm sure you've heard it, David, where people believe that the old world, such as Mesopotamia, Jerusalem, Lebanon, all that stuff was actually here in the United States. And they believe this theory uh, based on, I and I can, I I have to say I do not know what what their theories are 100% based on because I haven't looked at any of the evidence that people supplied. Um, but the question is, was the old world, was Jerusalem in the United States of America? And David, what are your uh, biggest either pros or uh, arguments against that that you can think of being somebody who studied history and Maybe you know, it, maybe not an archaeologist by any means, but you've looked at different things. What is your thoughts on this? Well, the immediate answer to that is no. <laughs> Jerusalem mm -hmm. is where Jerusalem is, which is where it has always been. But what has changed is the relationship that Jerusalem now holds to the rest of the world. And I believe that at the time of uh, the days of plague, the earth was divided and that the earth is no longer arranged structurally and geographically like it once was. There's a lot of, uh, as a matter of fact, we're going to do a Sunday night live in the near future called Cain Tucky, showing the similarities of uh, things in Kentucky with things in the Levant and the race of Cain. And also, uh, there's, uh, I've also taught and maintain and still do that uh, uh, Tinoc Tilion, and which is where Mexico City is, is the city that Cain built named after his son. So Jerusalem was where Jerusalem always has been. But the idea that we've been taught in schools that there was no communication or travel in the ancient world before the flood, there certainly was. There was worldwide travel communication. And uh, that's what's changed. So you can see goodles and boodles of evidence of the culture of the Levant, you can see Canaanite uh, remnants in South America and in the United States. So the short answer is no, Jerusalem's where it always has been, but things have changed. And uh, that would be what I would have to say to that. Yeah. And one thing that I would even just add to that too is, of course, you're going to see the anomalies of all of these ancient Canaanite structures all over the world. And one of the main reasons I think that the, like David said, they traveled the world, but also at one time, Pangea, the idea of all of the continents kind of being together at one time, I think is biblical. And you look, if you look at um, the Bible, what it says about Peleg in, in Genesis 10, 25 and in first Chronicles 1, 19, it says it was, wasn't until Peleg when the earth was divided. So at one time, everyone had access to all these areas and, um, we're not just talking small empire here. I mean, there you, you people think all, often think, okay, well, they uh, didn't get very far because they weren't very smart or whatever. But the Bible tells us that it, they're all their language was the same, and that they were basically accomplishing things that mm -hmm. he didn't want them to accomplish. So yeah. therefore, he changed their languages. He he separated the lands. Um, all of these things he could do in order to separate them because of the amount that they had achieved, um, you know, achieved in, in all the wickedness. The Bible talks about the wickedness pre-flood, but uh, there was a mass amount of wickedness, but there there was also a division of the earth 
as well. And so we have uh, these structures that are, I mean, they're, they're everywhere, of course. And you're right, David, like they, the reason they seem similar is because they are similar. They are most likely headquartered and ran from, they were ran from a central power source, which um, none of us really know exactly where that main power source was at the time. But I mean, I know there's a lot of speculation. What do you think about that? Where do you think the main, obviously Atlantis is the name that everybody throws around, but where do you believe the main power structure for these Nephilim kings and these um, people who are, you know, just completely had taken over the world? Where do you think that was? Well, the more I study and the more I look, um, I'm leaning toward uh, a Tartarian origin. The idea that uh, this Nephilim race spread uh, down through Tartaria into Samaria. I think that is probably um, the oldest Nephilim civilization. Of course, that's very debatable. It, some people yeah. would say Egypt, some people would say Sumer, and there's a lot of things they could bring to the table. But I'd probably lean to the um, Tartarians giving birth. There's a, there's a, The Tartarian tablets have similar letters to the Sumerian uh, alphabet, and that's a pretty good piece of evidence. Yeah. Yeah, it is it is interesting. I remember one show we did about Tartaria. I, I think I, I can't remember the exact reference, but we showed these tablets that they yeah. found that they considered mm -hmm. older than yeah. uh, a, lo a lot of the languages that were considered the oldest. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a real quality there. People often ask, you know, where is Tartaria and all of this? And was it Atlantis or Tartaria? But you, you, it's hard to separate the two when you figure out that they were both controlled power systems that presided over the earth at one time. Yeah. Yeah. And in the, in the Pacific regions, they talk about Lemuria. And the people that study in the Eastern cultures, the, they believe that that mother civilization was Lemuria. Yeah. And, and Lemuria in the Pacific and Atlantis, in the Atlantic area, and all of the things uh, that we see, there's, I can't remember the figure, there's like 50-some cities buried under the Mediterranean Sea. Mm. And there is so much, and all of this was basically that uh, the ancient kingdom that fell under judgment. Yeah. The Bible talks about it too, yeah. and I'm sure that, you know, we'll bring it up a thousand more times in, in shows, but it's definitely, um, there's a lot of mystery there, of course, but the thing is, it's like we can only really go by what is available in literature and archaeology. And, yeah. and just going back to the original question, to me it would seem that the all the tablets of the people that were found were in that area there was there's statues there's architecture in the area that talk about kings that were presiding in the area such as in egypt um such as in jerusalem you find uh caves that have things like the dead sea scrolls in them and so it's really hard to imagine that that's not the reality of where that is i mean unless you have people that are taking these things and hiding them in these caves hoping somebody's going to find them one day which I mean, I've heard weirder things, I guess, but I don't. I, I just see that to me, it doesn't make sense that the USA would actually be Jerusalem, and I think no. that I think there's a Mormon, maybe a Mormon principle, or I can't remember the the religion that's talking about Utah possibly being this this place. So, so I'm sure that yeah, it would derive from the people who would benefit the most by that. I would think. I think it was Herbert Armstrong that would say J E R. USA, L-E-M, -E yeah. Jeru, USA. But in uh, Genesis 11 and 6, it says, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, yeah. which they have imagined to do. In other words, they're going to be to do anything they can think about. You know, they're, they're uh, far from being uh, the dummies that... Um, some people portray them to be, they were on the verge of, you know, unlimited things that uh, the Lord put a stop to. That's so true. So next question, and this is a really good one. I think that it deserves a little bit of your time, David, and it's, and it is heaven and hell and eternity. Is that a reality? Do people really, um, stand to be held in contempt enough to be burned 
forever and do people actually go to heaven forever so that's a, a double double uh, question there but both of them speak to eternity yeah there is a reality to eternal punishment and to eternal blessedness uh, with the Lord and uh, absolutely in the language that Jesus uses in Matthew 25 there are people that want to do away with the doctrine of hell and they will try to use uh, the the text in uh, in Matthew chapter 25 but uh, in verse 41, it says, Then how shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And the very same words that are used for eternal reward are used for eternal punishment. And both of them are reality. And uh, people, uh, you know, hell is something that uh, is a very biblical doctrine. And for ever since there have been Christians, this has been one of the doctrines that has been held and proclaimed by the church today. It's uh, mocked and it's ridiculed and um, doesn't make it any less real. But absolutely, eternal uh, blessedness, eternal reward, and eternal punishment in hell are both very much solid biblical doctrines. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of verses that I've heard that make it really hard for me to understand how people can say that biblically they've proven that there is no eternal place of judgment for the soul, a lake of fire for the soul. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around where that comes from because obviously there are verses that clearly just plain out say it, you know? Well, let's say who would start that one? <laughs> I wonder who would be the little fellow to start that one. We could probably come up with a name, couldn't we? I'm sure. I'm sure there's several of them out there, and but I can think of one. I'm sure you're thinking of the same exact yeah. one. So, well, good, good answer there. So next one is the Shroud of Turin. Uh, actually, David, I, I, I think you did a show about this. Either that or we interviewed somebody about this very subject so what do you know about the shroud of turin what do you believe about that well i would probably tend to say that well not tend. i would say that it's not authentic uh there's a text of scripture in isaiah that speaks prophetically of christ and it says that his visage was so marred that they could not recognize him. And that doesn't look much like the imprint on the shroud there. And there's also the Luciferian Masonic theory. This was put forth um, uh, in a book. Uh, oh, what's the guy's name? Wrote the Hiram Key. Uh, mm. We've quoted that book yeah. several times. But he says that he believes that the person on the shroud is Jacques de Molay, the Knights Templar. And this is popularly believed by Luciferian Freemasons. What I believe is that uh, it's just something it's uh, people tend to go wild over relics. You know, relics. They think this is the bone of this person, that person. And, uh, you know, the Shroud of Turin doesn't interest me at all because I don't put any stock in it. Gotcha. I, you know, when I, uh, from what I understand now, David, I could be wrong. Um, the guy that now I watched some, I watched a video of a guy per, basically finding this video or finding this thing. And he's like this high level 33rd degree Freemason that finds this thing, just finds it out of the blue. And I was like, you know what? I, I understand that they see a shroud and there's nobody in it, but to me like thinking in my mind how could i replicate that easy i would put the shroud over a dead body that had been you know beaten or bloody or whatever and then i could pull it off of that body the same way but i guess maybe there's not a lot of things i don't understand about it myself but i've never really put a lot of stock into it either i i really am skeptical when people say that they've found this or that yeah christopher knight and robert lomas those were yes. the two individuals yep. that wrote that book um, yeah putting forth that theory right on and, and so, i would probably believe it's jock de mole rather than jesus but you know it's just one of those things it's a rabbit hole that you'll do yourself well if you don't jump down true and somebody had the question and i'm sorry i, I can't find oh yes jane 
Stevens in the chat. So we're taking uh, questions from the chat and email. If you email me here shortly or in the chat here shortly, then we can do it. I have one question that I harvested um, right here, and it is from Jane. She says, why didn't God stop Cain from killing his brother or bringing Abel back to life? And I'm just going to say something here. This is something that everybody ponders. Why doesn't God stop this? Why doesn't God stop that? Why doesn't God do this or that? But what we fail to remember is that we have free will. All of us do. Ever since uh, we've had this fallen nature, we've had the free will to choose to do right or to choose to do wrong. And I think that when God created the earth, when God created man, he didn't want for Adam and Eve to fall. And, and I know a lot of people say God knows everything about the future and all of this stuff, but he said he repented, repented of him that he made man. He was sorry that he made man. And maybe, maybe it's not like, oh, I'm sorry I made him. I didn't know what was going to happen. But either way, he was upset that he made him because of the choices that they made. So he allows us to make choices. He may know what the probable outcome is. He may know that, but he allows us the opportunity to be make choices. Otherwise, we would be robots. We would be programmed, and we would have the only choices available to us were the ones we've been programmed with, which I don't believe that's how it works. I believe uh, now that we're in this system, this is a system of finding who is going to follow God and who is going to follow the devil. And we're going to make that choice in our lifetime. That's what I believe. And and I know that I could be wrong and uh, there's a million different ways I could be wrong. And I know that I can't understand God or I can't understand even the way he thinks. But I would, I would say that um, he gives us free will. And I mean, it's pretty apparent that we all have free will to do whatever we desire to do. Sure, he could stop us. And he does for his own purposes. He stops people from doing things and he intervenes at certain points. But I just, I don't think that, um, I think free will is something that is, is freely offered to us as humans. Um, and we've, uh, Adam and Eve had that free will. They even, they had the, the temptation sitting there right there in the garden where they lived and they had free will. They were perfect. Just like the angels who were perfect. They have free will as well. They, they completely turned their back on God and, had free will to do so. So um, that's that's just my my opinion, of, and take it for what it's worth. What about you, David? Well, the we're created in the image of God, and the Lord said unto Adam, it's not good for man to be alone. We're created to be a social creature. We enjoy being around uh, other people. We enjoy seeking out a mate. And God, we're in the image of God, and the Lord wanted a group of people that he could fellowship with and that would love him and that he could commune with. And it says in Scripture in Ephesians, we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. This is a part of God's great plan. But to have people that would love him he has to give them the option to choose to do so. If we were just all made to love God, that would be a phony love, wouldn't it? Real love chooses to love. And that's what the Lord wanted. So he give mankind the ability to choose to love and serve him, which also created the possibility that people would choose not to. Mm. And therein is the crux of the situation. And the Lord knows he has perfect foreknowledge. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows what we're going to do the rest of the evening this evening. But foreknowledge is not predetermination. And man does most certainly have free will. Right on. Um, this next question is from Allie. Uh, she says, do you all believe that God already knows our life path? Who will follow him or who won't? It says our names have already written, written the book. Interesting. Do you think God knows who will follow him? Uh, I, I do remember, too, he talks about names being blotted out from the book as well. Uh -huh. um, and it's is it possible that it's up to us to get our name blotted out? Um, that's a question I have, too. Good, David, what do you think about this? Well, most definitely. You know, this doesn't sit well with a lot of preachers, but there's clear scripture that the Lord will blot out of his book those that sin against him. Right. And certainly, does the Lord know what all who's going to serve him and who won't? Yes, because he has first perfect 
foreknowledge. He is omniscient. He knows all things. But the fact that he knows all things doesn't mean that um, he makes people do what they do. But because he is omniscient uh, and knows all things, he knows who will serve him and who don't. But that does not mean that people are born uh, with a predetermined course of action. Our free will determines that. This next question I'm reading from a, from an email. This person's name's Bill, and Bill says, "John and David, how can we be sure that you guys have not sold out with as many views as you get on the Midnight Ride?" And I and I, I thought you know that's a valid question because oftentimes you see people that get lots of views and lots of publicity, and you know that they've sold out. There's like no doubt in their mind. I'll say this that. I have I collect no money from Google. I collect no money from Facebook. I collect no money from Instagram. The only money that now you see TV makes is based off of the viewership, the people that view, mm. and the money that it's completely supported by you guys and is supported by people that are on our website. I don't have any other people paying me anything at all, not one bit, and that can be proven 100% on my part. And David, what about you? What I mean, obviously, we speak we speak the God's word, but I mean, a lot of people do that that are controlled opposition. Yeah. But I I can tell you this for a fact: I don't make a mo bit of money off YouTube. I've been demonetized for a very very long time. They won't even give me the opportunity to remonetize. I can't advertise videos on here. I mean, I'm I'm in that place right now. So yeah, that that you if if I was sold out, I wouldn't. Uh, I would be collecting tons of money from a lot of different people, but I'm not. So there you go. Yeah, neither has FOJC. We have never been monetized on YouTube. Our, uh, we're totally listener-supported by the, the love gifts of our listeners. And the uh, uh, and ultimately, you can't know, but the, the thing that the reason why we do have supporters at FOJC and now you see TV is the witness of the spirit that we have with our listeners. And because we have that witness of the spirit, that the spirit bears witness within us and them. And because they feel that they are being enriched spiritually, they are led by the Holy spirit to, to, to help us in what we're doing. Now, one indicator I might look to that we, John and I have noticed this a lot of times, just, let's just take the book of Enoch for, for, cons, for example. There are people out there that have done videos on the book of Enoch that have two and three million views that all they do is read the book of Enoch in a creepy voice. Mm -hmm. You know, basically, it's about what it is. And we have done, and we've got some... Uh, some of our videos have got a lot of views, but proportionately to the, and our, and just no brag, just fact, the, the quality and the research that we put into our videos, there's no comparison between us and a lot of these other videos out there, but yet they're getting more views because we're being shadow banned and uh, all of the, all of the things that we have to deal with. So that might be a pretty good indicator right there. Right on. It's so true, man. It's hard. It's really, you know, we grew up, we, we were born into a system that, you know, we claim to be free, but we have to pay to be here. There's so many things about this system that will show you that if you are in opposition to what they do, they're going to do whatever they can to make your voice minimal. And, but you know what, there are people that are able to break through. If you look at through ancient times, David and Goliath, David, for instance, David was a person that God anointed to break through and to be um, someone who lifted up God's name in, in a yeah. world that's still controlled, you know, has is, is been controlled by evil. And so that can happen. So we're thankful for that ability and we're thankful for whatever God lays in front of us, whether it be millions of people or tens of people. It doesn't really matter because God has a plan, I think. And, and if and we're not perfect, I know I'm not perfect. If you went through every thing that I've ever said and did in my life and picked it apart and found everything, you would be like, man, this guy sucks, you know? And, and that's the truth. But at the same time, like God's redeemed people like me, he God's redeemed people like David and uh, the chance to be able to speak and show his redemptive power 
in all of this is really what we're after. We don't really like, you know, we're, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a, I'm not a pastor. I'm not much. I, I, I don't, I wouldn't claim any of that stuff personally because I'm, um, I'm a guy that, that changed his life and decided I want to lift up God's name in the best way that I can possibly do it. And I, uh, I want to do it through to the people that are searching. And I knew that the topics that we talk about, that's the things that people are truly searching for God start to look into. They start to look at stuff, anything and everything that they can find to find God. And so I want to be someone who is a farmer that's throwing the seeds out there for them, you know, and that's, that's really the reality of uh, our ministry. And I know um, David has other facets to their, their ministry that they do and everybody's different, right? We're all have different parts in the body of the Messiah, but um my goal is never to be to be rich off of it, never to be famous off of it. In fact, the more fame you get, the more money you get, the worse time you have a go with these people at the top that want to uh, shut you down. So God's got us where He wants us right now. So we just praise God for that and be thankful. Amen. So, all right. Next question is from Mike Bosler. He says, "Hi, David and John." According to the KJV, how do you get saved? And David, uh, this is a you've been preaching the gospel message for a long time, and in the KJV. And so, tell me, tell me, and tell the audience, what are your findings on how do you get saved according to the Bible? We were saved by grace through faith, Ephesians two eight and nine. We are saved by, in Romans 10 and 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And we confess him as Lord. That means, uh, like in Mark chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. Repent means you turn from your sins. And confessing Christ as Lord, there's the implication of obedience. We repent of our sin, and we confess Christ as Lord, and we, we believe it, that we receive remission of sins by virtue of Christ's death upon the cross. We're, we're repenting and we're believing that Jesus died for us. In 1 Corinthians, in the 15th chapter, uh, it tells what the gospel is. And uh, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day of the according to the Scriptures. He died for us, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for our sins. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So when we are convicted that we're a sinner, uh, it's uh, it's not a bad deal. We sin and Christ saves us. And if you're convinced that you're a sinner and you believe Jesus died for you, if you're ready to repent and turn and confess Christ as Lord, that is the gospel. And that is real, real good news that Jesus is there ready to save those that will look unto him in repentant faith. Amen, man. And I think the reason that people have tried so hard to manipulate these simple truths is because obviously they don't want people to understand what it's all about. But there's institutions that are designed, multi-billion dollar institutions designed to pull you, to pull you to them, whether whatever religion or denomination or whatever it may be, they want to be your ambassador to God. They don't want you to know that you don't have to be a part of their organization to experience God and to be saved by God and to live as a priest according to the kingdom of God. They don't want you to know that. And so any way they can manipulate that message, that, that under, simple understanding of the idea that we can be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, the idea that we can turn away from our wickedness and turn away from the things, the chains that hold us down and, and keep us um, chained to to evil and chained to heartbreak and, and all the things that come along with that, 
that's that's definitely a message that um, many, many, many people before us have been killed for presenting. Just the idea that you can experience God without these institutions and without their um, blessing from their their um, ordained one, I guess you could call it. That's what got Jesus killed. Yeah, that's what got Jesus killed, exactly. And um, So, okay, next question here. Sorry, I'm having trouble with my mouse here. All right, so another one from, um, or no, I'm sorry, from Nicole Reed. She says, my question is how do you wear sackcloth and how do you put ashes on? Um, and, I, and I know David knows this and I know this. So, David, what do you, well, how do you do this? Well, I guess you just put it on. Yeah. And sackcloth is like an old gunny sack and ashes. You just... Uh, you make yourself look to be, you know, and you're no one's real pretty or fashionable with the gunny sack on. Yeah. And that's the thing is you are humbling yourself and you're, you're doing it for a reason to show that you are repentant and that you are disgusted and appalled by things that are happening. And to, you know, it's going all out, you know, sackcloth and ashes, you know, we're really all about this. You know, you see me and uh, I'm looking a little silly. Well, it's for a reason, because we need to be repenting about some things that are going on. That's right. Yes, and I remember instances where they talk about they would put them on and then they would just sit in the ashes. And like David said, it's like the it's the best way of showing that you know you come from you're you're going to ashes eventually one day from dust you return. Or from dust you came, from dust you return, and just showing God that you're humbled before Him, knowing that you're but a mere creation of His, and and that He is all powerful, and mighty, and that's you know, I, I want to, I definitely would love to even just, even if it's just people here locally or whatever, but just hold a day where sackcloth and ashes were just that's all it is. You know, there's not a big party, there's not a big anything. It's just sackcloth and ashes, and if you anybody willing to do it. Get me a gunny sack. Yeah, exactly. I've actually got quite a few of them, man. I've, I've just in case. I ordered them just in case. I have no idea. I ordered. I don't even know how many. Probably like forty or fifty gunny sacks for for that. And I've got plenty of ashes that I can um, do and do. Yeah, so I could. Uh, I could be in for that. That would be cool. So uh, next question is from Mike Bosler. Um, Hi, David and John. Why doesn't the church keep Passover like Jesus did? Well, I guess the simple reason is they've been caught up in the traditions of men, and it goes back to Catholicism, which basically institutionalized Easter of in, instead of Passover, and the Church of England came along, and they didn't do any better. They reinstitutionalized it, and uh, there were there have always been those that have rebelled against those pagan holidays, the Puritans, uh, the original Puritans in the 1600s, they didn't want a part of it. Neither did the, the early Church of the Martyrs. And, you know, that's basically it. Uh, they're following the tradition of men that was uh, picked up by Catholicism and continued by the Church of England. Now, I think basically every uh, denomination today, they're all about Easter and uh, not about Passover. I think that's pretty much across the board. Yeah, I mean, I, I growing, up, growing up in church, I very rarely um, heard anything about um, any relevance behind Passover, other than you know the Resurrection Day type thing. And and it was really that's the cool thing about when you choose to kind of observe these holidays, you learn a lot about God, and you learn a lot about what was done uh, for for us you through this sure whole do. thing. Yeah. Okay, so next question. Uh, Jamie says, what do you think about CERN starting up again on the 8th of all days? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that makes us all feel just real calm and happy, doesn't it? And, you know, this, uh, I, and John knows I've never been one to get all fizzed up about all of these conjunctions and all this or that, but this one's a little different. Yeah. Uh, this in here is a little different. There's just too much there that um, is pointing to stuff. And I tell you what, uh, we need to really pay attention. 
we really need to pay attention. And I didn't know that. I didn't know Stern, Stern was starting up April the 8th. But, yeah. yeah, I say let's keep an eye on things. That's what I say. Yeah, ex- I mean, it's interesting, man. I You know, it's hard to know what's going to happen that day because obviously – I think that obviously there's a chance that America's due for judgment. I think that, and I think that these signs might be something to look at. You know, I, I, all I know is this, when it happens, it'll be too late. Once everything goes down, it's going to be too late for everybody on earth. This, there's not going to be time to sit there and uh, get your oil. Let's put it that way. There's no, there's no time for that. I remember a dream that I had that, that haunted me until the day I started believing in the Messiah, I had this dream, and this was like not not long before I went to jail. And I'm laying in my bed, and um, everything starts going crazy. The sky is like on fire. Everything is going just the craziest I've ever seen. And you know, and, and instantly I knew this is the stuff I heard about in church. This is like the Book of Revelation yeah. happening. And I went over to um, my my nightstand normally in my nightstand i would have a gun or something like that there or even a bottle or something and uh but there was a bible there and i went to grab it and i instantly fell to the ground and and all i heard was it's too late and it just reminds me of how jesus talks about on his final return how it'll all come it'll just happen quickly and, and nobody will even realize it it's just like boom there it is like a thief in the night he's coming and that that right there uh, shook me, and I do believe that it, it it's never a bad time to repent, especially if you feel like God's telling you something could happen here because he could be warning you, right? He could be warning you personally, and it's you don't want to wait till it's too late. You just don't want to wait till it's – because by the time you realize what's happening, um, I think it could be too late. I don't think you're going to – I think when it talks about the virgins with the oil – I don't think that I think that that's a real clear representation that the ones with the oil, the ones that were uh, anointed by God, anointed and and seek, seek that anointing. They they kept that anointing. They kept that Holy Spirit. The idea behind um, you know serving the King. They were ready, and the other people weren't. They didn't have the oil, and it was just too late. There was no way to give that oil to them. There was no way for them to have any oil at all. So I, I believe that. That parable means a lot there. I don't know. What do you think, David? Well, I think it absolutely does. And um, we've talked ever since the midnight ride has been the midnight ride. We've been talking about preparation and about the coming judgment of God. And the only thing that surprises me is that the judgment of God hasn't fallen yet. It is certainly ripe and it's certainly imminent. And kind of the options, I think, that are there for the eclipse. And, of course, nothing might happen. Yeah. But I think there's a, a there's a good possibility either uh, a couple days before or after or even on the day of an earthquake. I think an earthquake is a real possibility here, whether from the judgment of God or induced by man. And I think also the the possibility of a terror strike is at that time is also uh, quite high. And uh, there I've never seen so many states and government uh, institutions that are for an eclipse to say, you know, be ready, uh, be have extra food, have extra shelter, alternative ability to communicate and all these things. I've never seen that before ever on an eclipse. Yeah. And it makes me wonder, do they know something? Yeah. You know, do they know that there's a, uh, a terror strike in the works here? So I think that's an option. But Whatever it is, we need to watch and pray, and we need to be ready. And we, like John said, we need to have our uh, lamp filled up and our wicks trimmed, you know, because when something bad happens, you can't get your stuff together uh, just like them foolish virgins. Yeah. Uh, when the midnight cry goes out, you better be ready. You either will be or you won't. Um, next question from Jojo. I call him the rapture bus guy. Cause that's all that's usually what all he comments on here is rapture bus. I don't know exactly what the meaning behind it is, but he has a question this time. He says, when angels battle, can they kill one another? David, what do you say about that? I don't know. I don't, I've never seen biblically a situation where, uh, angels killed another angel, but that doesn't mean I know, uh, every, you know, I can't, I, I can't think of the situation. What do you think, David? Well, um, 
I don't know that I can find any reference of uh, an angel killing another angel. But what we do find in the angelic wars, um, and I could probably find an example here, in uh, the book of Enoch, and it's talking about Azazel, and it says in uh, Enoch 10 and 4, and again the Lord said to Raphael, bind Azazel hand and foot and cast him into darkness. Angels are able to restrain and confine other angels, <coughs> but I don't think I've ever seen a scripture where an angel kills another angel. I don't believe there is such, but yeah. Yeah, I've never seen one either. I can't think of one. Um and I and I you know, I know at one time they're going to be thrown into the pit. And I guess you could think of that as a, an eternal death. Uh so that will happen, but yeah, I've never seen anything that talk obviously there's going to be a war. There's going to be a war as well. So I don't know, man. That I I I'm like you, David. I haven't seen any scriptures that say that, but I also um don't know what might happen one day. I don't know. Be interesting to see it happen, though, huh? Yeah, yeah. So, anyways, um, next question from David Dosen. Um, what is the best book, obviously, beside from the KJV that can help introverts approach and witness to those who may be reluctant to the Word of God? Is there a book you think that is good for apologetics? Um, that you can think of a book to help witness to help witness other than the Bible, obviously, but a book that can um, help them with the intro because they're introverted, which means that they, you know what introvert means, yes, but they, yeah. they're not able to thoroughly express themselves the way they would like sometimes. Yeah. And the, the real cure for shyness uh, is, uh, acts one and eight, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. And I would there's some really good books written by good men of God to to help in soul witnessing. One that I would recommend would be Soul Winning by Samuel Logan Bringle. He worked in London with William Booth, and uh, he was a street preacher, and uh, one who knows how many people to the Lord and soul winning by Samuel Logan Bringle. Also, there's a book on soul winning, by Charles Spurgeon, that's very good. Also, uh, my third one I would recommend is a book on soul winning by Ari Torrey. I think any or all of those books would be a great help to you. Right on. Yeah, I know shyness is debilitating for some people i mean it's one of those yeah. things that really impacts people a lot and in every aspect of their life sometimes it may yeah. be just in their job or whatever um but david's right you know the power of god is able to overcome these things moses was one i can think of in the bible who um was i guess he just his ability to communicate he didn't believe it was very strong he he believed that he had a, a problem with it and God mm. appointed somebody to help him. But through all of that time, eventually I th feel like he probably came up, came up with his own voice through um, practice and through going through things and seeing it done. And um, I know that, okay, so in sales, for instance, it helps to go around with somebody that knows what they're doing and, and is able to, do that it helped it, it helped me with sales like i used to do door-to-door -door sales before i you know when i was young i was really young i was a, i think i was 19 when i started doing that and i was shy and believe it or not i was shy i didn't want to go up to people's doors and knock on their doors I, I just i was like what no there's no way but i went with a guy that did it and he showed me that it could be done and that it was uh, actually not very hard you just had to have the guts to talk to people so uh, and I, well, there's, there is a class too that, um, and I don't know everything behind this class. I mean, as far as I know, they're all they are is a class where you go to and you, you public speak. And I think it's called the, um, um, toast or their toast, their toastmasters. Toastmasters is a place. A lot of local people have them at their libraries where you can go. The whole point of you going is to present a public, um, say something in public, give a toast, talk about something. And that's the whole point, because the more you do it, 
the easier it gets. I mean, there's no doubt the more that you do something, the easier it gets for you to do it. Your nerves are a lot less, um, I guess, messed up when you go to do it. And, and you, you begin eventually get good at it and you feel the desire to do it. So, um, groups like that are pretty good. It's hard, maybe, maybe hard to find in your city in particular, but, um, the, the books David suggested are really good books for, for apologetics, I believe. So, Anyways, uh, any other suggestions, David? David? No, and of course the greatest one is um, just relying on the Holy Spirit and uh, receiving the boldness of the Spirit and also the wisdom of when to speak. Yeah, yeah, that's a big one too, man. That's a big, big aspect because if you speak out of God's timing, or you're speaking out of personal ambition, or you're just trying to trying to win this argument and that that can be detrimental to your conversation big time if you're not waiting for god to open the opportunity for that to happen yeah yeah good point um next one um holly says as a new believer i've started reading the bible can you expound on exactly what cain did to offend god with his offering i've been pondering this what do you think david well basically uh, Cain brought uh, the bloodless offering, and Cain bought, or and Abel bought the the blood offering, and that was it. It is by the uh, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins, and uh, every false religion brings the offering of Cain, and the only true religion is that typified by Abel of the shed blood of Christ. Very good. Very good. Yeah. And, and one, like you, like there's a verse that says without, without, um, blood, there's no remission yeah. of sin. Yeah. And you can't get blood from a turnip. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the first lessons they learned after the fall is, um, when God slew the animals and made the skins to clothe Adam and Eve. And uh, this was a graphic lesson to them that what they did resulted in death. The wages of sin is death. And uh, this is a lesson that King failed to learn. All right. Our last question that we're going to address tonight is from Ali B. Is it a sin to prep or should we just have faith? I wrestle with this. What do you think, David? Well, I did years ago. Back on shortwave, I was doing a show. I've been teaching this and for years since the 80s. And there was one fella just really give me the dickens. He just said, you know, you just don't have faith and going on and going on. And I, I said, sir, uh, when the store shelves are empty about the third day, you're going to get a big revelation from God. And he goes, he said, well, what's that? And I said that you like to eat and that mm -hmm. you like to eat regularly. And that is going on. And of course, one of Noah was one of the biggest preppers, uh, you know, and we could look at so many examples in the Bible of Joseph doing the preparation there in Egypt and so much, you know, the Lord gives us common sense and the Lord takes hold in our life after we have done what we can do. The Lord does it like lazy people. Uh, the idea that serving God and trusting and depending on him means we do nothing is an erroneous concept. But I think that, you know, prepping far from being a sin, I believe it's a sin not to. The Bible speaks to the role uh, specifically of the man to provide for his family, and just in plain common sense, let's say that uh, you you live down on the, the Florida Keys or the Gulf Coast and the hurricane's coming in, and uh, you say, well, I'm not going to prepare. I'm just going to stay here and trust God. Well, if God really told you to do that, you're okay, but, but uh, you know, to just be stupid, a lot of people died doing that. So, I think far from being a sin to prep, I would say it's more of a sin not to prep. Yeah, and and of course, it, there's some people that obviously have no money to prep. They just are they're on a basic income, and that's it, right? They're widows or whatever. They don't have that ability. And I would say that 
first off, you know, obviously what David's saying is 100% true. You need to prepare yourself if you can. If you cannot prepare yourself, I would I would say this, find people um, that are about community if you can and find people that might be able to help you if you have family you know, find people and let them know, like, you know, if things go down, I don't have anything. I don't have a way to survive. I don't have any of these things. And I need to be able to figure out what I need to do to do this. And so I, I have, my heart goes out to you because I, I understand like, uh, you know, that there are people out there that have absolutely no means to do this. They can barely afford to go to the grocery store and get food for today, much less food for a week from now, you know, or food for enough for a year. And, um, if you're truly reliant on God and hearing from God, I think God can feed you. He fed the people in, in Exodus. He fed um, one of the prophets. Was it Elijah? A bird brought him food. That can yeah. happen. That can happen. But yes, it can. But and that. But I think that if God's given you abundance and He's prepared in your mind to do so, you might not just be preparing for yourself. You might be preparing for people that desperately need you when the time comes. So you know, keep that in mind. And I would also say that we have a preparation page uh, on our website, FOJCRadio.com, that can be a help to you. And a lot of people certainly have a greater ability and opportunity to pray, prepare than others. But there's really, uh, it, there's very few people that can't prepare to some extent. You know, you there's things you can do, and I think our... Uh, our preparation page there will be a help to you. I'll read a scripture here in Matthew 24 that's really very clear about what it says. But, uh, well, I'll just read it. Matthew 24 and 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Now, everyone, <laughs> almost every 100 out of 100 preachers say, well, that's spiritual meat. Well, why is it spiritual meat? Um, it applies to spiritual meat, but the the steward here is the person that was put in charge of the home, making sure there were supplies and that it was well stocked. And it says, blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. So I think that definitely uh, is speaking to what the Lord is going to do of having faithful and wise servants that are going to prepare. I think another way, too, to prepare for this if you don't have extra money is to utilize the ability to have free education right now uh, due to all of the outlets that you can find anything for free. You can find anything, to, how to do anything for free. And bushcrafting um, is a, I think that it could be valuable because nobody knows if they're even going to be able to make it home when stuff happens. They don't, nobody knows that for sure too. So you to prepare in more ways than just food preparation is not a bad idea either to know um, what real humans used to live like, to be able to see <laughs> that, <laughs> that pe people didn't always have an abundance of things. So there are free education and stuff like that. I, I know that I'm going to, if, if uh, the Lord doesn't tarry, I'm going to be doing, or not doing, I'm going to be taking a bushcrafting class myself so that I can learn these skills in this area. So, you know, there's other ways to prepare as well. Education and also medically, there's going to be people that need medical help. You're, you're going to have to make yourself valuable in some way, shape or form. Uh, I believe, uh, and that's what the Bible tells us to do. Like David said, don't be lazy. You know, get get out there and learn. Be able to be an asset to other people in some way, shape, or form. I think that that you know that's the best gift we can give anybody. Anyway, is knowing how to learn and also being able to um, be an asset to people in need. And I mean, if we can't be an asset to people in need, it's going to be really, really hard to be an asset when we need to be an asset, we have to learn that. And that's something that right now free education exists for, for all of us pretty much. Um, I'm sure there's some things that are hidden away for us not to see, but mostly you can go on YouTube and find any number of videos. I have no idea how many, but I, I've several pages you can scroll through people say, you know, Hey, in this area, check out this, you can eat this or check out this. This is how you make this. And 
And nobody wants to live like that. I get it that nobody wants to live like that, but that might be a reality. That might literally be your reality is to live in a, uh, handmade cabin that you made in, in the woods somewhere or in a cave, who knows? But, um, those things are important as well too. I think, you know, education is always important. Any, uh, any last words, David? No, I think that's pretty well covered it. I think so. I think that that's good. Thank you guys so much for, um, coming on here and asking questions and for, uh, we're, you know, this is inadequate, but it's our one of our ways we get to connect with you guys is we love to be able to connect with you guys on on more levels. But um, because our our listenership has grown so much, it's it's so hard for us to be able to actually uh, comment to different people or even email. We just get so many of those. So this is a good way for us to be able to kind of check the pulse and see how people are doing. And and obviously when we have local kind of events like the baptism coming up, um, that's coming up this Sunday. Um, these are good ways as well. And so, um, for that, we're thankful. We're thankful to be for everything you guys do for your support, for all of that, for more, uh, questions to vote on new questions or add new in our fellowship group on you or on Facebook, you can go there and vote for your favorite question or add your own question and other people can vote for it as well. The poll is made to where you can add your own suggestions through there. So make sure you guys do that. I'll tag everybody in the fellowship group on that again so people can remember where it's at. And uh, But it is featured on the top of the fellowship group. Also, if there's a pressing question and you want to email me or David, and if we happen to see that email, David can print it off, bring it over here. I can you know, print one off and bring it over here too. And if that's, But you're a lot more likely to get your question in on the fellowship group or on the chat live. Um, than anything so but with that being said that's all i got thank you guys so much for subscribing uh david end us out big thank you to each and every one of you that listens to now you see tv and uh is a part of the ministry and is takes part in asking questions and learning and uh we appreciate it so very much and we enjoy doing this uh q a so thanks a lot and until uh next thursday night uh, we'll we'll see you then. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Rise up.